so today, uh, Toby McGrath uh, is an associate scientist here at the Woods Hole Research Center. Um, he uh, received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin uh, in 1989, I believe it was. And he's worked uh, pretty much all of his career um, in uh, Brazil, and to some extent in, yeah, pretty much all in Brazil. And uh, he's worked as a uh, professor at the Federal University of Pará. Pará is one of the states in the Brazilian Amazon. But as you're going to see here today, uh, what he's going to present is by no means, um, you know, academia. Um, this is not um, uh, hypothetical stuff. This is real on the ground uh, working with fishers and fisher communities. Um, and that's really what he's been doing most of his career. He was also one of the founders of um, two very important Brazilian NGO organizations. Um, one is called Imazon, and the other one is called EPOM, which stands for the, uh, roughly translated, the Brazilian, or the Institute for Research of the Amazon. And we work very closely with them and have ever since uh, they were founded. Um, so that's really uh, uh, Toby's work is to be involved with organizations on the ground and communities and, and with the government to try to find ways of, of merging the multiple interests uh, to find uh, pathways to sustainability, which is one of those holy grails that we're all still searching for, uh, like e equality and equity. Um, but um, maybe uh, Toby will give us some insights as to where we can find it in the fisheries. Toby. Thank you, Eric. Thank you all for coming. Is that too loud or is that OK? I think I hear my own echo. Um, but uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And it's especially a pleasure to be able to talk about what I've been doing for the last 20 years and sort of, as you'd say in Portuguese, do prestação de conta, which is to sort of explain, show, give your, you know, uh, show what you've been doing and what you've done over those years. And, um, so this is an opportunity for me, really, and it's been enjoyable putting together this talk to sort of bring together the elements of a very long-term process. And I should say right at the beginning that, that uh, a lot of this is due to the kind of support institutions, Woods Hole, EPOM, and donor organizations like WWF especially that were in there for the long haul. And that's increasingly not the case with the perception of funding and, and strategies. And I think, I hope that this will show something about the importance of that kind of long, long-term support, which is beyond the, the horizons of most uh, donors and many other institutions. So what I will be talking about then is about the developing a long process, starting with grassroots movements, and through their collective agreements, developing formal management systems for floodplain fisheries in the Amazon, and then dealing with the other elements that come that are part of that puzzle, and also taking advantage of policy changes to, for, to strengthen sustainable management in the fisheries. And I'll say at the beginning, we're not there yet by a long shot. There's more to go, maybe another 20 years, but that's less and less my job. But I will describe this process, and we can discuss then any further implications that you may have of it. So I will start trying to ground us a little bit here by talking about the crisis in world fisheries, um, get on to talk a little bit about inland versus marine fisheries, a little bit about the differences, the importance of inland fisheries, which don't get, as I, my view, anywhere near the attention they deserve from a conservation perspective or from a social perspective. Um, threats to inland fisheries, then the bulk of the talk will be about the whole process of developing community management, based management of floodplain fisheries, and some final considerations. So we are now in the midst of a global crisis in the world capture fisheries. Some people have asked me what I mean by that. I mean, as opposed to aquaculture where you're cultivating fish, capture fisheries are where you're going after wild fish, wild fish stock. Um, we have major decline of the regional fisheries throughout the world. Problems being overfishing, pollution of coastal inland waters, climate change increasingly a problem, temperature changes, acidification, and other factors that are associated with climate change, habitat degradation, both marine, coastal, and inland, 
And all of these, the threats they represent to the livelihoods of the populations that depend on these fisheries. Uh, here in New England, we have witnessing now the crisis in the cod fisheries, once one of the most abundant fisheries in the world a couple of hundred years ago. Today, as you can see here, stocks reduction of 77% in the catch for the Gulf of Maine. Fishermen rightly complaining that these measures are may save the fish, but they're going to kill off the fishermen in the process. And I put, added this bumper sticker that I bumped into, uh, so to speak, recently, um, because it, it sort of captures that polarization of perspectives and the importance then of co-management, ironically, to address this kind of polarization. And I'll get back to that. We look at graphs of trends in the fisheries. You can see then that the global marine fisheries have peaked sometime in the 80s and have bounced along since then, um, never quite making it to 90 million tons per year. Uh, inland fisheries have been much more stable, uh, somewhere around 7 or 8 million, million tons there. And this difference then is the fantastic growth of aquaculture. Um, there's, we could discuss this later, the role of aquaculture, the the role of aquaculture in undermining management is what I would say about that for, uh, for inland fisheries at any rate. Um, but if we look at it in more global perspective, then you can see these are collapsed, this fisheries here from 1950 to 2000. These are the overexploited fisheries growing. Um, these are the exploited, that is to the limit. And these are the ones that still have some margin. And you can see then that from 1950 to 2000, We've gone essentially to a situation where 45% of marine fisheries are overexploited or collapsed. The, another 40% are at the limit, and we have very, very little margin in terms of marine fisheries. And I would say that the situation in inland fisheries is certainly at least as bad, if not far worse. Um, one of the dynamics that we have is this process that they call the fishing down, where you start with high value large species. As these get selectively removed, you begin to move to smaller and smaller value species. And as that process goes, you move along this gradient here. It's more and more effort, less smaller and smaller fish. Looking at, going back to that graph, you end up with something that looks like this. Looks like you're fairly stable over here, but that's hiding this complete destruction of the fish communities that are being exploited. And you get into a situation that is increasingly unstable as you depend on short-lived, fast-growing species that are often very sensitive to environmental conditions for spawning. And the result then is at some point collapse. In the Amazon now, we are in a better situation in this regard. Large species like the pirarucu and the manatee are endangered. Other important species like large migratory catfish, that's the pigachi, it's a is a, is a, uh, the juveniles are 30, are 30 kilos, so they're not mature until they're over 30 kilos. Um, the tambaki, an important species, these are growth species then that are overfished, but there's still a large number of import, commercially important species who seem to have fairly healthy stocks. So the process has begun. It's fairly well advanced in the Amazon, but nothing to that extent. We compare here small scale fisheries now, marine, inland. Um, you see that while marine is about two-thirds of catch compared to the inland ones, um, inland is, is more focused on domestic consumption. That's to say it's more subsistence oriented, meeting the, the food needs of the population. Both small scale are in that case. The catch per fisherman is smaller, about a third that of the marine, about 0 0.7 um, or 7 tons. If you look at numbers of fishers, however, you'll see that of the 33 million estimated fishers, in the small scale fishers, 63% are inland. In, in post-harvest numbers, 54% are. 55% of, of women are in the, in the inland fisheries. And overall, total employment is higher in the inland fisheries than the marine fisheries. Another example, then, of the importance of these fisheries um, socially throughout, especially the third world. And the inland fisheries have another problem. That is to say, they are 
extremely vulnerable to a range of impacts within their basins. They are, you can't just separate. So here we have fishing. You can manage the fishery, but if you don't have some mechanism of dealing with this whole range of threats that are affecting areas within the basin, then it may not matter what you do with the fishery. For example, deforestation, either for agro-industry or for ranching then, is affecting the interfluvial areas of the entire basin. Okay? That will affect runoff, it will affect pollution of uh, agrotoxins and, and nutrients that are going into the water, and it will affect the flood regime. Dams are blocking the rivers, um, affecting migration, and movement of fish up and down. Um, urbanization, also important sources of pollution. In a place like the Amazon, there are no sewage treatment systems in any of the urban centers in the Amazon. So you can see, you've got a lot of water and you have the potential to pollute a lot of water in the case of the Amazon. So overall, when we talk about managing inland fisheries, their enormous vulnerability to this whole range of impacts is the problem because the managing fisheries, as we've seen here in New England, is difficult. If you also have to be dealing with a range of other impacts and the enormous interests that are behind any one of these, then you can see that inland fisheries are really quite vulnerable. Um, just to give an example, here's a, a map of current and future impacts on the Amazon basin. The yellow are areas that have been deforested. The red lines here are planned um, waterways or existing waterways. The, the circles are dams. The red ones exist, the orange ones are under construction, and the white ones are planned. All in the Andes, all through the, the Brazilian Plateau region, and a few up here. And these hatched areas are all petroleum leases, either planned or existing. The mining activity is in here. When you take this to a small scale and look here at a little tiny place here, these are all the little check jam dams that ranchers have placed in. So the, the stream network is completely fragmented by these kinds of actions. So we can see that in the Amazon, while the fisheries are okay so far, we can see already that the, the potential for massive transformation is huge here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is really what I would consider to be a 20-year experiment in developing community-based management systems for the lower Amazon floodplain. These are areas that are not parks, they're not reserves. These are what we call the closest thing to sort of privately owned floodplain lands and collective acti you know, efforts to conserve these. And this is a work that is involved combining, as, as Eric mentioned, science and policy, doing the research on commercial fisheries, the ecology of floodplain fisheries, the impacts of floodplain land use, both fishing, ranching, forest clearing, uh, studying community management systems and analyzing policies. It also involves community initiatives, grassroots, Partnerships with grassroots organizations, community organizations to develop fisheries management agreements and capacity at the local level, organize communities, environmental education, and mobilize in support of policies in support of community management. Key actors in this work have been the Varzia communities themselves. Varzia I haven't mentioned, defined yet, sorry, I thought I had. Um, Varzia refers to floodplains of the Amazon. I'll give you another definition in a little bit, but that's what Varzia means. So floodplain communities, the local fishers unions that represent all the fishermen in the, in, in the municipalities, NGOs, the two key ones for this work, have been Woods Hole Research Center, of course, and IPOM, our key partner in Brazil uh, for a lot of this work. Government agencies, a, a, a number of different agencies, of important at different times, and then of course, especially international, but also national donors that have supported the various phases of this work. And as, as Eric mentioned, the important thing here, for me at least, is to see this as an experiment, to be making interventions, see what happens, try something else, see, see and learning through that process. It's a long-term collective process of learning. This is my favorite name for the Amazon, Uyumar, the River Sea. And I think it captures better than any other name the size of the Amazon River. You know, it provides almost 20% of the river water entering the oceans is provided by the Amazon River. 
There are holes 300 feet deep in the Amazon. Here in Manaus, along in there, there are holes that are 300 feet deep. They're below sea level, the bottoms of the, of the river in that section. And in other, other areas are. So it's a huge volume of water. The largest basin, um, I think it's the largest basin in the world. I'm not sure about that. I didn't look it up. 40% uh, of the South American continent, you're here are the headwaters, you're within 100 kilometers of the Pacific Ocean, all the way across to the Atlantic. Ocean going vessels can go up 3,000 miles or more to Iquitos here. Um, and there are something, 3,000 documented, perhaps probably as many as 5,000 species of fish in the Amazon system. So a huge diversity of fish species, not to mention other species. Just a huge system. The key thing about this from a fisheries perspective is these rivers. These rivers have their origins in the Andes, geologically active, dynamic region, a lot of erosion, and they then are providing the, the sediment that creates the floodplains of the Amazon. And it's these fertile floodplains and the and sediment, nutrient-rich rivers, waters, that are responsible for a great part of the productivity of the, excuse me, am I blocking the, of the Amazon system. Okay. And so Varzia then refers to the floodplains of these rivers these rivers that are originated in the Andes and are filled with sediment. Um, our the work I'll be describing is mostly taking place in the region called the Lower Amazon. This is the Tapajós River here, uh, Sungu here, the Madeira, which the Madeira all by itself, if it were to take it to the South Ocean, would be one of the two or three largest rivers in the world. And it's only one of three major tributaries there. So this is the area that we'll be working in. Um, for most people, their notion of the Amazon is basically a result of the events of the last couple of decades. As these highways were built into the Amazon and ranching, colonization, and logging followed them and cleared these areas. But this has been the focus of Amazon settlement for the previous 400 years. Since about six, since the early 1600s, settlement has moved up the navigable rivers and into the Amazon basin. So this is the pre-existing traditional Amazonia. And the fisheries and the movements that I'll be talking about have their origins in this traditional Amazonia. So here's the area that this talk will be focused on. We were to take a, a cross section of the Amazon River at the lower Amazon from the river, the main stem of the river through to the uplands. You'd have a series of roughly four main zones. The river itself, the levees here that are originally forested, um, these grade into a natural seasonally inundated grasslands and finally into the permanent lakes that occupy the interior of the floodplain. You would repeat that sequence on the other side and there might be then a narrow channel separating that island of floodplain from the mainland. And economic activities on the Amazon uh, floodplain follow that same logic. People put their houses on the highest levees where the duration of floods is shortest. Um, they plant their annual crops and some perennials around their houses up on these high points. They graze cattle on these grasslands during the low water season. And they fish in the lakes and in the river all year long. The river fishery tends to be seasonal when the large schools of fish are migrating upstream. The lake fisheries are more productive in the floods in the dry season but are fished all season long. So what we have are economic strategies that seek to take advantage of the key resources and habitats of the floodplain. Um, so there are diverse strategies of which fisheries is a critical, but not the only one. If we were to look at this from above and look at it, you could see then three concentric zones in terms of land tenure. Okay. Properties are defined in terms of meters of frontage and then back to the middle of the lake as far as they're concerned, okay? Nobody knows how much air, their land in terms of area. They just know how many meters of frontage they have. Um, small holders typically have 40 to 100 meters of frontage. So they're small, small properties. Ranchers, far more, okay? These then have different property rights associated with them. The levees are clearly individual properties. Lateral bounds are, are, are demarcated. 
Where house investments are concentrated there, the house, any other agricultural activities. Beyond that, you have this commons of common, common grassland. And um, households then, may, if they have cattle, will graze their cattle in these areas. They have the right to fence it, but few do because those who have cattle usually have more cattle than land. So they would prefer to take advantage of this larger grassland. And then they also, inside that, is the lake. So these two zones grasslands and the lakes tend to be treated as a commons and, and used collectively and managed collectively. And the management initiatives that I'll be talking about here have to do with controlling grazing on the grasslands and fishing in the lakes. Okay. If we were to look at these habitats, this would be a typical house on the levee. You can see virtually no forest left some trees, but, and then agricultural activities in this area. Inland from that, you'd get these low, long, flat grasslands. This is the dry season um, that are used then for cattle. And inland from that, these lakes, here's the same lake in the flood season. So we have problems. Forest degradation is the problem on the levees. Much of that critical forest habitat is gone. Overgrazing of these grasslands, we'll get into that later. And problems with overfishing in the lakes. Fishing is very important in the household economy. And it's very important for a couple of reasons. The main reason is that it basically supplies the subsistence, the high quality animal protein that families need. Any, money, any fish left over can be sold to a local fish buyer, and that then is cash for subsistence for, for weekly purchases of, of you know, household needs. And any money that's left over from that can be invested either in buying cattle, small animals like chickens or ducks, or planting crops. And so fishing is fundamental. And when we talk about the importance of fishing in inland fisheries, we often don't recognize that that fishery is making possible a whole lot of other activities, the productive activities that are important. So another key element here is the productivity of fishing. fishing. If you have to spend all day fishing, you don't have time to plant. Um, so they manage a fishery. We'll get to that now. Community management strategy seeks rather productivity more than production. They would prefer to limit production and make sure that they can go out in a short period of time, meet their needs fishing, and come back. And they don't want to have to compete with other fishermen and buy new gear and do the whole process of capitalizing to compete more effectively. The other different element of their management system is that they prefer to protect the lakes and the fisheries in the low water season when fish are concentrated in small lakes and are much more vulnerable to somebody coming along with a big net and just scooping the lake out. So they tend to prohibit gill nets in low water. In terms of controlling catch, they don't have the means to monitor how many fish people caught. But they can restrict gear. They can say, OK, no, no gill nuts at this time of year. They can say, no styrofoam. Uh, ice boxes so that people can't store fish on the lake. They have to go back home. And these kinds of restrictions then will help to reduce the pressure on the fishery. And when they can, they will restrict access of outsiders and keep that outside pressure off. So these are traditionally, these would be the original basis of original community agreements for the fishery. Another element is, the, is what we call the flood pulse, the slow rise and fall of the river. The Amazon River rises slowly from the end of November to June, the, end, the beginning of June, and then falls more and more rapidly until the end of October, the beginning of November. That essentially follows the rainfall pattern, except that you need, this is the rainfall in Santa Reng, and this is, a, this is the collective result of 40% of the South American continent. So there, is not necessarily any relationship between the local rainfall pattern and what the river is doing. But they do coincide in this case. Um, and so they give you a dry season of falling water levels where agricultural activities and cattle grazing take place, and then a rainy season of rising water levels where life seems to slow down a little bit. You harvest your crops, move your cattle off, and fishing becomes less productive as water levels rise. This would be the same place, site, in both different periods of the year. It's just to give you an idea of, of the dynamic nature of this landscape. Um, 
key element is what we call the fish in the forest. That flood pulse, that water rising and slowly moving in for several months of the year into the, the vegetation, the forests and, and grasslands of the floodplain, provides important nursery habitat for, for, for uh, young, you know, juvenile species, and also an important food source. Many varzia tree species are adapted to fruit, and their fruit and nuts, seeds that fall into the water, sustain some of the most delicious fish in the world. Um, this here is a tambaki, a fruit-eating species of kerosene. Um, and he is probably using fruit, nuts, that he picked from these trees. Uh, and he went to a tree that was dropping fruit into the river, into the water, and fished right there to catch uh, his tambaki. So this relationship is important, and what that means is the quality of that habitat is fundamental to the productivity of the fishery. You degrade that habitat, deforest, overgraze, then the, the productivity of that lake fishery will be affected. This just to give you a brief sort of rundown of the time. So you have from the 60s into 80s the development of the commercial fishery, and with that, growing number of conflicts as commercial fishermen begin to move into lakes up and down the Amazon and use their nets to completely scoop out the lake. Um, in the 80s, grassroots mobilization and community agreements to basically define rules for fishing in lakes and to try and prevent outside fishermen from coming into those lakes. In the 90s, the government and local NGOs, and this is where we began to get involved, began to then to look evaluate the extent to which these community agreements can be transformed into legal instruments for controlling the fisheries. And by 1996 and from 2002, this system was put into place, and I'll describe that. Then from 2006 to 2013, we had a whole new phase in which the land tenure system was, new land tenure policies were put into place, and I will describe then what impact that has on the development of, of the, um, of the continuing development of this management system. Okay? And the neat thing here is that this whole process has been driven by grassroots movements. Many of you have probably heard of the rubber tappers and the, and the shikumandis and struggles against ranchers and loggers in, beginning in the late 80s. He was assassinated, I think, in 88 or 89. And after that, there was an enormously powerful alliance between grassroots movements and environmental movements environmental organizations in the Amazon. This is essentially the same process, the same, same origins, the same kind of process, but it wasn't about upland forests. It was about floodplain lake fisheries and protecting those fisheries. And it was all up and down the Amazon, the Peruvian Amazon, Brazilian Amazon. Um, and what we have in the lower Amazon and in other parts of the Brazilian Amazon is that it kick-started and put into place a process of formalization and formal recognition of the rights of these people. We have, basically in the 70s, we had a transformation in the commercial fisheries that set all this process going. And that was a process that I think at different times went all the way around the world in the traditional fisheries. First of all, you had synthetic fibers and gill nets that replaced cast nets and harpoons. Diesel engines and outboards replacing paddle and sail as the main form of movement. Ice and styrofoam ice chests replacing salt as the main mechanism for preserving fish. Um, the product then changed from dried and salted fish to fresh and frozen fish. An earlier pattern of localized fishing basically in the area around individual communities was essentially displaced partially by long distance urban based commercial fishers that could go hundreds or thousands of kilometers up river to fish. And at that same process you had then the partial eclipse of part time commercial fishers and their replacement by full time commercial fishers who are dedicated to fishing 24 hours a day. And so the conflicts that were generated by this growing confrontation between this new technology, fishermen that are coming in with gill nets and bigger boats and st larger storage capacity and taking the fish that sustained local populations um, was the source then of this whole process that we're describing. 
And we have here then the origins of what we can call co-management. You know, but that's, let me go here first. Let's define co-management. Co-management refers to some middle ground there where you have a partnership of varying kinds between the fishers and the government agencies responsible for regulating the fishery. Okay? And that implies some sort of decentralized institutional structure so that local government agencies and local community groups of fishers can negotiate, more or less. Uh, it involves then a collaborative decision making in which not just the government agencies are not dictating the rules, but fishermen and, and, and governments are negotiating the rules. This varies. It also implies some integration and combination of scientific knowledge and local experience and knowledge of the fishery. And it also involves some collaboration between government agencies and communities in both monitoring the status of the fishery and enforcing whatever regulations have been made up. Okay. Um, so in the case of the Amazon, typically you have co-management arising in the developed world as a result of the polarization and conflict taking place between government agencies trying to impose regulations on fishers that feel that the regulations are unjust and not unnecessary, and that they have not been properly um, consulted in the process. And co-management then developed in the 80s as a way of diffusing this polarization and seeking or trying to find some common ground and some way that together they could find solutions to the problem. In the Amazon, it was another situation. It was the, the complete absence of the government, the conflicts between commercial fishers and communities, and nobody there to mediate, nobody there to defend the interests of communities or of commercial fishers. And so the communities took it upon themselves then to begin to impose rules and regulations and try and keep out outsiders. But they did this not to eliminate the government, but to try and get the government involved. So in both cases, for reasons that were quite different, they end up seeking some sort of middle, middle ground where there is some form of collaboration between the communities, the user groups, of fishers, and the relevant government agencies. Um, so in our work in the floodplains, what have we been doing? Where do, what, are, what are the key elements? I would say that there are three elements, broadly speaking, governance, managing key species, and habitat restoration as the three main focus foci of our work. Here. And then for that, first of all, the question of how do we take these community agreements that communities have come up with and turn them into legal instruments that the government will recognize? Secondly, how do we deal with the problem of the plastic tragedy of the commons unfolding on the grasslands where more and more cattle are uh, degrading habitat. And how do we deal with a very ambiguous and conflicting, conflictive land tenure situation where the communities had no property rights and individuals had no property rights? And how could we recognize the existing traditional system that was in place? And then for key species, there are a number of them. The Piraruku is one I will describe a little bit of the work my colleague Leandro Castello, who may or may not be here, pioneered uh, a system for managing Piraruku, which is a wonderful fish, um, that is probably the most successful management system in the Amazon. Um, and well, not great potential to bring a fish back from the brink of extinction. Other species that are important commercially that have the potential for management are river turtles, caiman, and capybara. We, we have some work with these, but we're not to the point of uh, proposing management regulations for them, and the government won't let you manage them anyway. So first we have to deal with that problem. And then habitat restoration, reforestation, recovery of grassland. So our work then, and it was all scientists working with communities, and the community initiative was critical to this. Was very little of that was us saying, hey, let's do this. And more and more, oh, you're doing that? That looks interesting. Let's Let's see if we can help. Um, so the first thing was you had these agreements, the communities had come up with, they had no legal validity. However, the government was interested in exploring ways to make them legal or to adapt them so that the government could recognize them. 
And so we worked with the communities, with the government, to begin to uh, develop agreements that would be acceptable to the government. Um, and that, the communities, and so the first step was creating what we called regional fisheries councils. And these were inter-community councils that represented all the communities that lived around a given lake system. Those communities would get together and come up with a, a proposed agreement for regulating fisheries in that lake, their management plan. That management plan, once it was approved by all the communities, would be submitted to the regional uh, office of Obama, which was the agency responsible for managing fisheries at the time. If that agency decided, if that office said, okay, we have no problems with this, it was sent to Brasilia, the main office of Obama, and transformed into what they would call, uh, well, a legal document. I'm sure they use that. I can't, tra I don't know how to translate it. It's a legal <laughs> term that's used in Portuguese. That document then comes back officially. Obama trains community environmental agents that are then responsible for monitoring the agreement, monitoring fishing, and they work with uh, the Obama regional office agents to enforce that agreement in the community. That's the way this thing was set up to work. Um, between 1996 and about 2002, six here I said, excuse me, we set up seven of these regional fisheries councils. Here's Santa Bay is here. This is the Amazon River coming down this way. This is the Tapajós River coming in from the south, which is not a beautiful river. It's just a muddy brown river. Um, anyway, so these seven councils were set up for these different lake systems. Um, 140 communities on the floodplain and on the adjacent upland. Uh, population of roughly 35,000 people in these seven counties. Up and more or less down. When we studied, compared, did a study comparing the productivity of fishing in managed and unmanaged lakes that were comparable in terms of their physical characteristics, uh, found that Roughly 60%, the, the, the managed lakes fishing was 60% more productive than in the unmanaged lakes. Um, if you take out this outlier here, it drops down to about 45. That's half again as productive as the unmanaged lakes, which was an important thing to show because in a floodplain, the river comes up, covers the whole floodplain, it becomes one lake, fish move around, fish migrate. Does it matter what you do in an individual lake? You know? um, and so that was the question. And what we found is that, yes, it does matter. That there are more or less sedentary populations and fish um, that you can manage and have an effect from one year to the next. And you can improve progressively the productivity of fishing over time. However, while it worked from a, a resource perspective, we had a lot of problems from an institutional perspective. First of all, you have one group that manages the resource, but they are generating costs. It costs them. They have to go out and patrol. They have to have meetings. All of that costs money. They have to go to town and meet with agents and stuff. But, so they're, they're spending time and money to manage this resource. But the government will not let them exclude outsiders to obey the rules from fishing in the lake. So one group does the work. Everybody can have fun at the party. Um, so that was a problem. There are very few organizations that function effectively when the group that's doing all the work doesn't get the benefit. Um, so that was one problem with the agreements, uh, the, the, the government criteria for the agreement. The other problem was that they, ref they re were not allowed to charge user fees, any kind of a fee. You know, They could have a thing where, okay, everybody who fishes in the lake has to pay some standard fee or something based on the catch toward the management of the lake fishery. They were not allowed to do that. So they had no mechanism for recovering costs that way, nor were they allowed to control the marketing. They weren't allowed to force people to sell their fish via a community association. So they had no real control over it. Um, so that was a long-term problem. In the short term, that might work. Uh, in the long term, that could be a problem, especially when the government really didn't do its part to help enforce the agreement. The other major change had to do with ranching on the grassland. Ranching was something that was as old as settlement on the floodplain. Small amounts of cattle kept there. 
They were put in raised platforms like you see these sad cows over here. Um, and they would then be fed cut grass from floodplain grasses over the, every day through the flood season until they could get back off. With the introduction of diesel motors and larger vessels, they had the possibility of taking cattle off the floodplain during the, as water levels rise, put them on upland pastures adjacent to the floodplain, and bring them back again when the water levels fall. And so you get this kind of a migration pattern. And what you see then is that the floodplain land use is now being integrated into the upland land use and settlement on the uplands. And families will ma migrate back and forth with their cattle over the course of the year. This is a problem. Um, the main problem is that when you had this system, whoops, you had a natural control on how many keep cattle a family could maintain on the floodplain. And that was a small number, 35 head. When you go to this system, that control is eliminated. You can now put a lot of cattle in pastures up here and bring them onto the floodplain in the dry season. So you have the capacity then to put a lot more ca cattle on the floodplain than you could do previously. Now the constraint for smallholders is the amount of pasture that they can afford to rent on the uplands. But overall, it meant much greater pressure on the floodplain. And that then led to more conflicts, or cattle moving about, not properly taken care of or fenced, invading fields, damaging crops, wading in the lake, damaging nets. Um, so you had a lot of conflicts around cattle in the flood, on the, in floodplain communities. And so they came together and adapted the idea of a collective agreement to the, what they call the terms of adjustment of conduct. And these collective agreements then were used to, um, to organize cattle use, cattle manage, manage cattle grazing on the floodplain. Um, again, these provided mechanisms for compensating farmers. The members perceived some improvement. Rules were when cattle could be on the floodplain, when they could not. But again, there were no rules limiting cattle density and no minimal, no, and minimal government support for enforcement. So like the other one, problem. The third element, then, was land tenure policy on the floodplain. Here we have uh, an island, and this is the way the property, informal properties on the floodplain look. These concentrated areas are communities. Um, back to that zone, then, so we, what we have is a system of, of sort of varied property rights. In, properties, as I described before, but with different zones of use and community individual control. How do we develop a formal system that recognizes this diversity of rights and, and economic activity? And the government settled on what they called the agro-extractive settlement project. That is comparable to an extractive reserve. Some of you may know of that for rubber tappers. Um, and it was a collective settlement system that was designed to um, recognize traditional rights and use of resources on the floodplain. Um, and so it offered an opportunity then for, for residents that, to live long term in these sites, recognizing their territorial rights. They were required to, to have a utilization plan which essentially incorporated the collective agreements they'd already made and provided then a more unified regulatory framework. Um, and in theory, those rights to live on those ties were, were conditioned on compliance with the agreement. So in theory, they had a system that looked more effective. It was certainly more coherent. In the Santa Ana, well, in the lower Amazon, 41 of these pies were created, the, many of them based on the original co-management systems that have been described. Uh, 41 pies, 500,000 hectares, 14,000 families, about 70,000 people, all told, in, these, in this system. From our perspective, this looked like something interesting. This looked like it had potential to address the problems in the previous agreements, and it had potential then to give communities formal control over significant territory. Also, we thought that the utilization plans and then the other required document was the settlement development documents were, were interesting mechanisms then for not just controlling land and resource use on the floodplain, but also 
for promoting the sustainable development of the floodplain. So the utilization plans regulate all land and resource use. They integrate pre-existing agreements. They give the, the lake fish, the communities, exclusive control over the lake fisheries, which was not the case in the past. And the communities then have, develop, have a development plan that is based on the sustainable management of their resource base, in which has incorporated all this collective learning that has gone on about how communities can manage their resources. So we now have a way of dealing in an integrated fashion with the, ecosystem, the floodplain ecosystem as a whole. All the main habitats, all the main resources and economic activities in formal territory. Um, and so there is then the potential now to move to a new step, new phase in managing the floodplain. It then integrates these three levels, the property, the community, and the lake system in a way that the previous agreements had not, had left these sort of fractures. And it also then provided the base for beginning to then address the problem of managing key species. Here's the Pirarucu, wonderful beast. Um, they're called in the Amazon the bacalhau of the Amazon. Um, why? Because for several centuries they were, they were caught, they're, they're, um, they were filleted, so that you just, no bones, just the, the, the flesh. Um, and they were dried, salted, and were basically basic animal protein for rural labor, rubber tappers, and the urban poor. Nowadays, the urban poor cannot afford Piraducu, but up until recently, they could. Um, and the fish had many characteristics that were very adaptable to management. They have to come up to breathe air every periodically. So Leandro Castello developed a system for counting how many Piraducu were in a lake. He never was able to do that with another fish. Um, and that then enabled teams of fishers to know how many adults and, and juveniles they had and develop quotas and manage the fishery in a way that would be very difficult to do with any other species. Um, they grow, their, their, their reach maturity at a meter and a half long, um, and they grow to three meters if you let them, um, and some individuals larger than that have been found. So this is just pictures from a collective fishery in a community uh, near where Santarém. And then we estimate them. These, these here are community territories in the region around Santarém. And these colors then represent the density of Pirarucu in the lakes in that region. And they go from 34 per kilometer squared to, to zero, essentially, the white areas. These areas were not surveyed at the time this map was made. So you have some areas where you have some kind of reasonable management. And densities are fairly high, about 34 adults per kilometer squared. Overall, though, the average density is about 1.5 kilometer of individuals per kilometer. On that basis, the sustainable catch for this network of communities would be around 44 tons, um, with a value of about 200,000 reais. If we follow the management initiatives at approach that was developed by Leandro and adopted by some of these communities, you can bring that up to an average of around 31 individuals per kilometer, almost a million tons of, of uh, a million tons, a thousand tons of pirarucu flesh, I mean, you know, filet, four million reais. So you have here a management system that can lead off and basically provide the basis for managing other species because it is um, it is a species that lends itself to management, those characteristics in communities. So we are now working with about 30 communities in this area to train teams of fishers and get them, get them sustainably managing their local fisheries and conducting research on the Pirarucu and on the fisheries um, to monitor the evolution of the fisheries and the impacts on other species as well and the conditions that influence um, the productivity of lake fisheries. The second question is deforestation. Uh, this region was, saw a jute boom in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where jute was introduced from Bangladesh by Japanese colonists and spread through the region. Jute was planted on the levees where the forests were. So over 
uh, between 50 and 2008, uh, this, this study was done from 75 to 2008, found a 50% forest loss, the red area on here. Um, you can pretty much be sure that a considerable amount of that forest was already gone in 75. So somewhere between 50 and 75% of the forest cover has been lost from this area. And I know of no old growth forest on the floodplain in this region. So what they're calling forest is already a fairly degraded secondary forest. So another key thing is how do we recover this forest and restore its role in the productivity of the floodplain? Um, and once again, communities interested in recovering their the forests on the lakes, especially interested in it as habitat and food for fish, so they sought out species that provided seeds, nuts, and fruits that they knew fish ate. So here are, you know, five, six, seven years later, they grow fast. It's wonderful planting floodplain trees. They grow very quickly. And here, under that canopy of trees, is someone taking fruit from the trees that were planted and catching tamaki, which is a very a fruit-eating species. And so this is a model that we have developed. We know it works. We know which species are, are, have reasonable survival rates that would make this viable option. And we hope to be able to go and expand this to deal with the whole area of the floodplain and the communities um, that we are now working with. The third area is grasslands. Um, how do we recover grasslands, especially this species, which of Canarana, which is important for cattle and is also used in the flood season to feed cattle. And incidentally, it forms large floating mats that can protect the community. This is the dry season, but this is all lake here. That's all lake there. Houses are located along it here. And in the flood season, this all floods. And then waves and big storms will come blasting across and bang into the houses that are located here. So the community is planting large expanses of these floating grasses on either side to form buffers to protect the community from the action of waves. Here's an example of communities addressing the problems related to climate change, like large floods, violent storms, on their own initiative. They're not worried about what's going on in the rest of the basin in South America. They're figuring, what can we do to address the problem that's, you know, that we face the threats in our community, and what do we have at the hand? And this was their initiative that we have been supporting. The final element is building up an organizational base that represents these pies and can help them both, um, giving them bar bargaining power to negotiate with government agencies and also help them sort of to organize sustainable management and marketing of pie fisheries uh, on a larger scale and give them market power. So early on, we worked with a few of these leaders to form what we call the Forum of Varzia Pies. Here's one of their meetings. They would meet once a month. Leaders would come to town. And typically their concerns were, you know, problems they had to deal with different government agencies. Which agency? Who should they talk to? What should they go about? Um, and these meetings then were very important to them. And it, they gain credibility with the government agencies as well. Now the government agencies treat the forum as the representative of these communities. And it's a model that could be spread to other settlements on the floodplain. We now want, through the work with the Pirarucu, we want to then spread that organizational capacity to begin to manage on a large scale the fisheries of individual communities. So where are we 20 years later? You know, this process began with communities mobilizing to protect their resources. Um, they have achieved government recognition of their collective agreements. They've gained formal recognition of community territories. And they have made considerable progress in sustainably managing key resources. What are the challenges ahead? They have formal control over their territories, but there are a lot of ranchers that still have properties within those territories. That's one issue that needs to be resolved. They need to continue to improve the management of their resources. We need, there is a complete absence of policies in support of sustainable management or support, in support of the development of markets for sustainably produced fish and other floodplain products. And we need long-term mechanisms for capacity building and technical assistance that will ensure that each new generation develops the skills, the understanding, 
be able to sustainably manage their resources and improve progressively livelihoods while improving ecological sustainability and health of these floodplains. So thank you. Um,